turn to the person next to you say hey it's time to get in the game it's time to get in the game I am excited before we get into the word can we welcome our online family everyone that is watching from all over the country all over the state we love you we we, we appreciate you being a part of these ex this experience with us and um, let us know where you're watching from these people don't believe that you're real they think we just put up cameras to be cute they don't believe that you're actually a person with a name. So let them know your name and where you're, where you're watching from. Well, I'm excited. I'm actually overly excited. I need to take a seat for a moment. Um, as we prepare to, to go into the word of God, I want you to know we've been praying for you. I've been praying for you. And um, I, don't, I don't take it lightly that you would come this morning and, and give up of your time to, to come to this place. And I wanna make sure that I honor your time. But most importantly, I wanna make sure you honor your time because you can come in with the wrong heart, posture, wrong perspective, and this is just a, a inspirational talk, hopefully, if even that. But I believe that if we, all of us, allow the Holy Spirit to soften our hearts to receive the living word of God, not my words, but God's words, I believe that's where transformation takes place. And, and what the Bible talks about, it's never an issue with the seed, it's always an issue with the soil may even be an issue with the farmer. I'm not saying I'm a perfect seed sower, but I think most importantly, if we allow the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do, we can walk out of here differently than we walked in. So, so let's, let's pray for a moment. Let's ask Holy Spirit into this moment. God, we thank you that you would love us enough to wanna speak to us, to wanna commune with us. Thank you for loving us more than we love ourselves. And so I pray, God, that in these next few moments that I decrease, you increase, that you open up all of our hearts and eyes to receive whatever it is that you have for us. I'm only given one sermon, God, but you are going to do away. You have this thing where you dice it up and you can make it personal for hundreds and hundreds of people at the same time. So the Holy Spirit, soften our hearts, help us to receive the living word of God. We can leave here differently than we can. Expecting it, and we're partnering with you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Let's stand up for a few moments. I have a feeling a lot of you have not read your Bible enough this week. I just, that's not even a God thing, that's just me looking statistically. I just, so we're gonna make up for that this morning, I promise you. We're gonna go to Daniel chapter one, and I'm gonna start at verse three. Do you like the person you're sitting next to, standing next to? If not, it's too late. You should have thought it out. Daniel chapter one, I'm gonna start at verse three. It says this. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Everybody say captives. It's one of them days. You're gonna help me preach this, okay? Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Ladies, turn to the man you walked in here with and say he would select you. Come on, say it in faith, ladies. Say it in faith. Say, you would get selected, boo. You didn't lie. You didn't lie in church. You spoke it in faith. You're, you're, you're prophesying. Prophet lying, huh? It's okay. Verse 4 continues. He said, make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to, everybody say, serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years and then they would enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called a bad Negro. No, my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. White people looked up like, whoa, whoa. That's my pastor, come on. <laughs> babe, did he say it? <laughs> yes, babe, he did, you're not. <laughs> All right, verse eight, we gotta stay focused. We should have prayed longer. Let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter five. 2 Corinthians chapter five. 
I'm going to start at verse 13. It says this. If it seems we are crazy, turn to the person next to you and say, we're a little off here. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. And that is my prayer, that you would not just hear of him today, but that you would actually intimately know him just a little bit better. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. I want you to know the fourth value that we're, as we go through this Living for Legacy series, the fourth value we're going to talk about today is, is vital. And I want you to say it with me. Say, our city, our city. is our responsibility. I don't believe you. I don't believe that you believe you, but I got 30 minutes to make you believe it. So let's, let's let God do what he does. God help us. Amen. You can be seated. Our city is our responsibility. I remember uh, growing up playing basketball. Uh, I wanted to be the best. I wanted to be you know, like Kobe. I wanted the mama mentality. And so I figured Kobe's the best because he's the best scorer. And he's the best defender, all NBA, scoring all NBA defense. So I was like, I got to be the best on both sides. So in my mind, I was like, okay, if I'm going to be the best, that means whoever is guarding me, I got to score more points than they do. And then I got to stop them from scoring. And as long as I do that, I do my job. And so that's what I focused on in high school. I just want to outscore you and make sure you don't score on me. Simple. And I'll be honest with you, uh, I didn't really win a lot of games in high school. It wasn't because of me. Obviously, my team sucked. I can't help. You know, I don't. You kind of. You are. You, you know who you are. I can't choose the kids that come to my school. There's only me, you know. But uh, something happened when I got to college. I had a new coach and he had a, a habit of no matter how great I was playing, my playing time felt inconsistent. So like I would I would have a. A guy that I was guarding, oh, thanks, giving me a jersey. I could be part of the team. So I'd have a guy that I was guarding, and uh, I would size him up, be like, oh, this is cake. This is easy. Welcome to the island. Get in my stance, like, oh, you look like you ain't got no left hand. I already know what this is. <laughs> and so as soon as he passed the ball, job done. Locked him up. Did my job. What happened? Aaron didn't do his job. All right. Next possession. All right, what's up? Come on, welcome to the island. Make a pass, locked up. Aaron, you got one. But I would notice that Aaron wouldn't get pulled out. I would. I'm like, coach, he's the liability, not me. But my coach had this philosophy that a great defender is not just focused on shutting his player, his opponent down, but he understands the concept of team defense. And with team defense, I'm not focused on stopping my man. I'm focused even after he passes the ball, I rotate over to help side so that I can recover and help my teammate. And I know you're thinking, he brought up all those basketball players and wasted three minutes of my time because you don't play basketball. I can tell you don't play basketball. But I'm not talking about basketball. I'm talking about your life. 
because what I believe is that there are too many Christians that have a I did my job mentality. And we are so focused on as long as I take care of me, as long as I do what I'm supposed to do, as long as my family is taken care of, I've done my job. But what you do not realize is God did not just call you for you. He did not just call you for your family, but he placed your family in a city. And so if you live in a city that is losing, if you live in a city that is lost, it is because it is not enough to just focus on your family. Because if your family is in a city that is losing, your family will suffer. It is not just enough for you to focus on hanging out with your family friends, but because your friends live in a city that is losing, your friends will suffer. It is not just enough to focus on, am I right with God? Because if your city is lost, the heart of God suffers. And if we don't shift our mentality to, it is not just my family or my life or my legacy that is my responsibility, but it is my city that is my responsibility, my legacy will suffer. My city will lose. And eventually my family, my friends, my coworkers will be lost because I had a selfish me first mentality. Thank you, fellas. So, so I want us to shift our mindset as a church, okay? And I wanna teach us as a church what our actual responsibility is. It is not just your responsibility to come to church. I was raised in a church that said it is your responsibility to become the church. And so what does that look like? It, it, I'm gonna break it down for you in a couple ways. Number one, as a church, it is our responsibility, everybody say, to pray. To pray, to pray what? To pray God's will for our city. To pray God's will for our city. One thing about Daniel is if you look at his life, you notice very quickly that Daniel was a man who consistently modeled that prayer was a priority in his life. Daniel was famous all throughout the kingdom of Babylon for his prayer life. Daniel prayed three times a day, bold prayers, windows open, let people, making people feel uncomfortable type of prayers. And what happened was anytime Daniel ran into a situation that he felt was beyond him, he had a, a built-in habit of praying. But when it got really crazy, he took it up to another level. I want to show it to you in Daniel chapter two. This is a situation where the king of uh, Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, he's having some tormenting dreams that, that he can't figure out, that he can't understand. And so he assembles all the, the wise men and all the people uh, to figure out what his problem was. But Daniel was so consistent with his prayer life that he was already praying for the king before the king asked for help. Daniel made it his mandate to be the intercessor for his city. And so and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Daniel chapter 9. I'm sorry, I said 2, but chapter 9. It says this, during the year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord. Now, this is important when it comes to prayer. We talked about this last week, and, 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 and during prayer is our party. We talked about how to pray effective prayers, and it starts by being in the word of God, so you know the plans of God, and you pray the plan of God over yourself, over your city. So it says that, Daniel, I learned from reading the word of the Lord, as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet, that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. Everybody say prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. Jump down to verse 20, please. I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. He's not just praying for himself. He's praying for people that don't pray for themselves. He says, as I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. How many of you could use a little insight and understanding in the culture and chaos that we live in today? This is what it says. At the moment you began praying, a command was given. What happened? God, Daniel prayed, God responded. And now I am here to tell you what it was, for you are very precious to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of your vision. You are very precious to God. Listen carefully so you can understand the meaning of your vision. I want you to know that the same way that Gabriel spoke about Daniel is the same way that he speaks about you. 
you are very precious to God. The problem is, is just as precious and as loved as you are by God, you are equally hated and despised by the devil. Let me show you. Jump down to Daniel 10.10. 10. It says, just then a hand touched me and lifted me, still trembling to my hands and knees. And the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. So listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up, get your posture right, for I've been sent to you. When, I, when he said this to me, I stood up still trembling. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. This is important because sometimes we believe the lie that since we're not seeing results, that God isn't hearing us. But listen to this. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, th th that represents a demonic entity. Then Michael, one of the archangels, one of the big guns, came to help me. And I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Okay. You're loved by God. You're hated by the enemy. God has a plan and purpose for your life. So does Satan. The difference between you and the people that you love, experiencing the fullness and the purpose of God, is not if God wants it for them, it's if you want it for them. If you want it for them bad enough to intercede on their behalf. If you want it for them bad enough to pray for people who won't pray for themselves. This is why as a church, every single Tuesday, Throughout the year, we have prayed for our city leaders. We prayed for our city officials. We prayed for our nation. Why? Because we recognize the fact that if we do not stand in the gap for our leaders and our politicians, the devil will have his way with them. We pray for people we didn't even vote for. This is my problem with the westernized American church. We spend more time teaching people from pulpits about politics than teaching them how to pray. Because regardless of who wins, you gotta pray for them anyway. So what happens when we have a generation of Christians that are more comfortable and more confident leading protests than leading prayer rallies? Why is it that we have normalized you posting your opinion, but you're not praying for the opposition? That is ineffective Christianity. And that is why the spirit of the king of Persia was making his advancement and, and, and blocking the advancement of the will of God because he was only having to fight against one man's prayers. And I wonder what is happening in your kids' schools. I wonder what is happening in your cities. I wonder what is happening in your own family because you'd rather complain about it and post about it and gossip about it, but you will not humble yourself before God and commit to being the intercessor. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God, I don't even like them right now, but your will be done in their life. And so Daniel says, I will take the responsibility of praying for a city that he was a captive in. But he said, I'm not a captive, I'm called. I don't accept the mentality of being a captive to this city, to this state, to this situation, to this organization. I'm called here. And since he understood that he had a responsibility being the called, being the chosen one of God, he said, God, forget what they're doing. Forgive them. They know not what they do, but hear my heart. Hear my cry. Forgive me as I forgive them. And God, just help us. And I wonder if God can count on you to pray for those you didn't vote for, to pray for those you don't agree with, to pray for those who make your life a living hell, to pray for those who you love just as equally as you pray for those who you struggle to love. This is what the Bible says. It says the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Do you realize the power that is accessible to you? Do you realize that your prayers are heard? Why? Because you are loved by your father. And what you notice if you read the life of Daniel is that you see this progression where you start to see a deeper passion for his city over chapter by chapter.
Why? Because you have to pray to develop a passionate heart for the people that you don't really like. It takes prayer. It takes humility. It takes a supernatural exchange with God, which is why sometimes you can't just pray. You got to push away some other things. That's where fasting comes in. I was talking to my barber, who's also my therapist, by the way. <laughs> I'm like, my insurance is starting to get, you know, weird. And I'm like, Deion Sanders told me, if you look good, you feel good. I'm like, so I don't need to talk to my feelings with some random. I could just talk to you. If I get a good taper, I feel a lot better. Depression, goodbye. <laughs> so I was talking to my barber and he was, he was really excited this past weekend. And he was like, bro, I, uh, I haven't smoked weed in 40 days. He's like, I'm in 40 days. Oh, you're like, what kind of barber you go to? <laughs> He's saying super cuts, boo-boo. <laughs> and this is, this, is, this is a very successful man. He owns multiple businesses, employs multiple dozens of people, and he's making a huge impact in his community. But he told me, he was like, I'm, I'm dealing with so much pressure. I start off the day, it was just every single day I'd have to get high to start off my day. I'd go to sleep high, I'd wake up halfway high, and I'd go straight to the garage to smoke again. And that was his cycle. And he was a successful functioning man with that cycle. But he said something happened. I went to my daughter's soccer tournament and it was in Utah and I couldn't bring my weed to Utah because it's frowned upon, you know, the Mormons don't play on the airlines, man. <laughs> and he said, so I had to wake up sober. And I was like, what is this? But he was like, we were there for multiple days, so every day I'm waking up, and he said, something happened. I started to wake up with a new sense of expectancy, like a kid again, like, anything could happen today. Anything. <laughs> and he said, we, I, kept that, I kept it going for a couple weeks, and we had another tournament in Vegas. And at this point, I'm weeks without smoking, and, and I go out our hotel one day, and I'm like, man, it stinks out here. What is that? And it was weed. But his senses had shifted because he had given up something in exchange. So y'all spent the past 30 seconds judging my barber because you don't smoke weed to get through life. But you have something that you rely on to get you through the day. You have something that you've become normalized and, and, and it's, it's what you use to kind of help you get through or help you get over. And I wonder if that's exactly why you need to learn how to fast and pray. Because when we fast, what we're doing is we're saying, I'm going to give up anything I could be tempted to rely on for temporary satisfaction. Any post, any like, any bank account, I'm going to push that away. And instead, I'm going to pray that God do a divine exchange through his Holy Spirit so that I no longer crave the things of this world. And I have a deeper hunger and thirst for righteousness that only happens when I kill my flesh and live for Christ. And notice what happens in Daniel's life as he models consistent prayer and fasting. He gets divine insight and understanding. Maybe you can't get insight and understanding because you rely on too many other things rather than the voice of God. You can't even hear, you wouldn't know the voice of God if it was yelling at you in some form of a young black dude wearing all black, you know, you wouldn't know. Because you found other things to supply your needs that are beneath his riches and glory. And so not only do we have to understand that it's our responsibility to pray for our city, but there's another P. It's our responsibility as a church to everybody say prophesy. It is our responsibility to prophesy God's word over our city. Now, Daniel was not just known for his prayer life, but Daniel was a prophet in Babylon. Matter of fact, there would be so many instances where the kings wouldn't know what to do. And, and I mentioned it earlier, they'd have these tormenting dreams and, and they'd go to their, their astrologers and their, their, their TikTokers and YouTubers and, and sorcerers, and none of them had the solutions or the answers. And they would be like, but there's one person who might be able to help this situation. And that's, that's where we find Daniel. And so in Daniel chapter 2, the king has issued a mandate that all of them got to die. All the wise men, because he's like, y'all ain't that wise. Basically, every source he was depending on that wasn't working, he said, I'm going to kill it. And Daniel said, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up. 
And in Daniel chapter 2, this is what he says. He goes to, he went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, what had happened. He was like, the king's lost it. He's stressed out. And now he's stressing everybody else out. And the, he says, he urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret. Everybody say the secret. So they would not be executed along with the other wise men of that Babylon. And that night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Think about this. The experts on the economy, the experts on relationships, the experts in every other secular thing had no answer for a divine problem. And Daniel said, let's pray about it. Let's fast about it. Let's get a couple. Let me get some friends to go in on this with me and ask God for a secret. What was he asking? He was God. He was saying, God, I need to see what only you can see. I can't see the dream of this man, but you can. There are certain things that going on in your life that you can't figure out, that your doctor can't figure out. You don't need a diagnosis. You need a prophetic word. You need insight and understanding from heaven. That's why we sing those songs. I receive your vision. Why? Because I don't want to see things from a natural perspective all the time. I need a supernatural perspective that I can't get off of a podcast or off of a, a Pinterest board. I need heaven to open up and the voice of God to speak to me and reveal to me the secrets that only he knows. And then it's not enough that I get it. I need to speak it. I remember when we uh, were planting Legacy and... Um, I, was, I wanted to be in Phoenix. Some of you guys know this story. I didn't want to be here. I like you now. I love you now. But I wanted to be in Phoenix. I thought it would fit my vibe more, you know. And uh, my wife, who's also my Holy Spirit, she was like, what about Chandler? I was like, what about it, you know. She was like, I think Chandler. And then I didn't listen to my wife the first time. So I had to go to another state. And I got a dream. And God said to me clearly in this dream, you need to be where your influence and your resources are. And I, I knew what he meant, but I didn't want to believe it. Because first of all, I was like, well, I don't have resources. But I was looking at it as money. He was looking at it as people. Because if I went to Phoenix, you wouldn't have came to Phoenix. You love me, but you ain't driving an hour and a half to hear me. You'll watch the YouTube. But in Chandler, you'll make that 20, 30 minute drive. So the influence where I was planted was where God wanted me to be. I wasn't a captive to the East Valley. I was called to the East Valley. So I remember when I knew God called us to Chandler, I started talking to you know, other people. Like, hey, so what do we need to do? And I remember one of the first pastors I talked to, he was like, you don't want to be here. This is not, your church will not grow here. He doesn't know we're about to do three experiences in two weeks. It's a secret. And so, and so we made a decision. The only voices we're going to listen to are voices of faith that align with the prophetic word that God gave us. So what we did is we started coming to the YMCA. And I remember we started leading these, these vision walks and prayer walks. And we would walk around the YMCA praying and prophesying over what was going to happen. And I was funny because I was talking to one of the families who helped start Legacy from the beginning. And the, I think their first time coming to Legacy was when we were on a prayer walk at the YMCA before we launched. And uh, he was like, Pastor Delisi is walking around with this megaphone and it's only 20 of us. We're like, why are you yelling into a megaphone? We hear you. <laughs> but she was prophesying over what would need to happen. Yeah. And she was like, and we're going to have greeters out there and we're going to have a parking team because we're going to have hundreds of cars filling this lot. And there was only 10 cars in the parking lot and we're going to have thousands of people flooding and there's only 20 of us. Like, what are we but she wasn't worried about what we could see because that's pathetic. She was working towards what she could see spiritually that's prophetic. And some of you have a very pathetic view of your life. And God told me to tell you, you need to start prophesying, not what you can see, not what you can, not what you've heard, but what does the Lord say about your situation? What does the Lord say about your family? What does the Lord say about your job and your city and your, what thus saith the Lord? Speak that. Tell the person next to you, I got a better word. And so what happens is you need to, it's very counterintuitive to prophesy. You don't have to be a prophet. You don't have to be weird. No, no. It's just understanding the word of the God, Lord, getting in your Bible and speaking what God has already said. That's a secret to everyone else. What does that look like? Okay. 
First of all, you need to understand that since you live not in this super utopian society where as long as everyone does their best and tries their hardest, we'll make the world a better place. The devil is a lie. You live in a spiritual war zone where you are battling the forces of darkness and trying to advance the kingdom of light. So once you understand that, you start to decipher and filter every label and title that is given to you and say, does this actually line up with what God has called me to? Now you can't always change the location, but you can change the interpretation, let me explain. Because y'all think I'm just throwing in words that rhyme, and I kind of was, but I'll, I'm going to work with it. Think, think about what we saw in Daniel chapter 1. In Daniel chapter 1, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, I'm forgetting one, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, Belshazzar. Let's just look them up. What do those names mean? Daniel's name means God is my judge. Belshazzar means, oh, wife of the god Bel, protect the king. What just happened? Daniel had a divine name given to him by his parents. The enemy perverted that name and demasculated him and tried to make it something that it wasn't. Then we keep going. The next name we see is Hananiah. Hananiah means Jehovah is gracious. They changed his name to Shadrach, which means I am very fearful of God. How has a house of worship and a house of miracles become a place of polarizing and mixed feelings that pushes people away rather than draws them in? Then you keep going. Azariah means Jehovah is my helper. Abednego means servant of the shining one. And the shining one was not Jehovah, it was a pagan God. Last one. Mishael means who is like God. Meshach means who is what Aku is. Notice the slight differentiation and perversion of what was divine. Is there one more? I got all of them. Okay. So Daniel, understanding that he is in a foreign land, but he's still called. They think he's a captive. He says, no, I'm called. He says, I need a prophetic word for this king, for this city. And he goes to his friends, not based off the label that the king's assistant had given them, but he says, hey, Hananiah, he's like, I'm calling you what your mama called you, okay? And he says, we need a new word. We need God to unlock a secret for us. What am I trying to tell you? Stop letting your city name you and you start renaming your city. You are not just a retail worker at Shields. You are the divine intervention between the forces of darkness and the forces of heaven. You are not just a teacher. You're an intercessor. You are not just a stay-at-home mom. You are a caregiver charged with instructing your children in the ways of the Lord. You got to stop allowing a city that is godless to rename a God-fearing person that is called to make a difference and an impact and change legacies. Tell the person next to you, don't let your city name you. So we need to pray. We need to prophesy. But the next thing we got to do as a church is we need to serve. Everybody say serve. We need to serve our city with the love of God. Daniel served four different kings during his lifetime. Four different kings. Think about this. Daniel's legacy outlasted every king's rulership. What if your legacy of serving others with love outlasted the toxic boss you can't stand, outlasted the president you didn't vote for, outlasted every situation that you were placed in because you were more focused on serving than being served. You were more focused on, focused on serving people with the love of God than receiving and needing all this affirmation for what you do. Because I'm pretty sure Daniel did not like all four of those kings. One threw him in a lion's den, one threatened to kill him. You, you think your work environment is toxic. You ain't seen Daniel's life. And we can't tell which king Daniel liked or didn't like because he served them all with love and excellence. He served the vision of kings when he didn't even like the king, but he felt called to that. that he, I'm, I'm here, and so if I'm here, God is with me, and I'm going to serve as unto the glory of God. I know what your resume says. You worked here, you worked here, you worked here. 
But what does God see at those places you worked? Did you work there and just collect a paycheck? Or did you serve there and bring glory to God? I love being connected to people that have a heart of servitude. One of my friends, uh, Danny Gonzalez, he, he, he grew up in the projects of Chicago and in a really broken home and poverty, homeless, all the things, really traumatic upbringing. And some, by some divine intervention, he encountered God and he experienced the love of God. He went from being a fatherless child to having his heavenly father speak identity over him, remind him, you are precious, you are loved, you are a man after my heart. And God, I'm sorry, and Danny was dumb enough to believe God and his word that he moved from Chicago to Arizona and started this organization called the East Valley Dream Center. And then the East Valley Dream Center, what they do is they serve resources to under-resourced families. Danny don't come from no resources. How he resourcing underprivileged families? And they do it consistently and it's grown and it's based in Chandler. And now every single week they are loving and restoring dignity to children and adults. And then he started multiple organizations that all have the same ethos. We're just here to serve our city. I wonder, isn't that funny, Danny, Daniel? I wonder how many people would have the heart of Daniel to say, no matter where God calls me, no matter what my upbringing was like, I'm gonna lift up the community that he's called me to serve. So we need to pray, we need to prophesy, and we need to serve our city with the love of God. But the fourth thing we need to do, it's not enough to just serve people all the time. Because sometimes they could take that as a handout, but they don't need a handout, they need a, a hand up. And that's where the power of God shows up. Matter of fact, that'll be my last one. We need to show our city the power of God. Everybody say, pray, pray. prophesy, prophesy. Serve, serve, and show. We need to show our city the power of God. The thing that was consistent in Daniel's life, no matter who that king was, is that he constantly showed them the power of God. We see it with Nebuchadnezzar when he was young. Nebuchadnezzar was stressed out. Daniel said, I can't interpret your dream, but I, have a, I serve a God who can. Let me show you what your dream means through the power of God. We saw Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, or bad, bad Negro, uh, end up in a fiery furnace furnace because they refused to bow down to the God of Babylon. And, the, and Nebuchadnezzar said, oh my gosh, I see three men. I put three men in there, but now I see four. And the fourth looks like the son of God. What did they do? They showed the power of God that no matter how hot it gets in here, I'm not conforming. I'm a stand for righteousness and godliness. And I'll show you who God is through my life. And, and, and this is one of my favorite things that happens as a result of that. Put, put up the next verse. This is what Nebuchadnezzar says. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. He didn't even believe in the Most High God in Daniel chapter 1. He had his own gods. But by this chapter, Daniel chapter 4, he's like, let me tell everybody in the world. How's the devil become an evangelist? That's crazy. Listen to what he says, verse three, how great are his signs, how powerful his wonders, his kingdom will last forever, his rule through all generations. He doesn't even realize that he's prophesying about the coming Messiah in Daniel chapter four, because he had seen the power of God actually materialized in a person's life or in people's lives. It, it, conv it convinced him and it changed his entire theology that there's a God who's greater. I might not even be ready to fully commit to him yet, but I know he's real. Do, do you know why we do homecoming at Legacy Church? Let me, let me, let me tell you. We started this church January 2023, and we saw um, in a short time the, the peaks of cultural Christianity. So like Easter, everybody and their mama shows up. Mother's Day, everybody who loves their mama shows up. And we were like, man, that's great. But then they go back to their lives. What would happen if as a church, we consecrated 21 days of praying and fasting, not for our benefit, but for our city? 
What would happen? And so we tried it. We, we just said, we're just going to go out. I just feel like this is what Holy Spirit wants us to do. So we did it. And for 21 days, we prayed. And we would have, you know, hundreds of people on, on Zoom at 6 a.m. Monday through Friday praying. And then we would get a couple dozen people showing up in a room next door on Saturday mornings at 7 to pray. And, and we weren't just praying for people. We were praying for individuals. So we would have cards and people would write out the names of their brothers and sisters and aunts and, and loved ones and friends. And they would say, I want this person to experience the love of God. And for 21 days, we came together as a church family and we prayed for people that some of us didn't know. But I'm like, hey, if you love them, I love them. Let's go for them. And 21 days later, we saw over 800 and something people show up to Legacy Church. Not for a helicopter drop, not for anything free, but as a result of a person who loved them or maybe just had a love for them saying, I want you to come to this church one day. And it was crazy because before that, there was only like 200, 250 people coming to Legacy. After homecoming, we never saw less than 500 people come to this church. It changed the trajectory of our entire, not just our church, but our city. Okay, that's just numbers. I, I get it. You need a name. Okay. If you've done DNA, anybody done DNA? Okay. This section, this is like the spiritual section. I don't know what's going on over there, but... Y'all are my people. Okay, so y'all know the Kimbros. You know Brandy, she leads DNA, and Ralph, her husband. Okay, okay. So this is something cool. So um, last year, they had just started coming to Legacy, and it was after some Sunday we had done some little event or something like that, and I'll never forget, we were in the hallway, and Ralph goes, this is crazy. Like, we are a supportable church. We are not a mega church with a building like weird. Why are we doing all this? And Ralph's a buff guy, so everybody's like, hey, chill, Hulk. Like, <laughs> hey. And then I'll never forget, on homecoming day, Ralph shows up. Brandy, she's all in. You know, she's just, I love people, Jesus. I love people. Ha. Ah. Ralph's like, what's up? You know. But on homecoming, Ralph comes, and they have a little son. He's adorable. His name's Ralphie. He's the most mature 10-year-old I've ever met in my life. He's like 60 in a 10-year-old's body. It's crazy. He's the opposite of me. And uh, on homecoming Sunday, Ralphie said, I want to... I want to declare my, my relationship. I want to give my life to Jesus. I don't want to get baptized. And you know who baptized him? His father, Ralph. So Ralph got to baptize his own son who lives in his home on homecoming Sunday. And one year later, you know what Ralph is doing? Oh, he's leading life groups. He's leading legacy DNA. He's, he's setting up, taking down. Why? Because he recognized that I can go from unchurched, dechurched, or overchurched by experiencing the power of God in my own life. If I can see the power of God manifested in my son, there's nothing I won't do for the glory of God. Because if he could do it for me, I want him to do it for the person next to me. I was, I was walking last night, me and my wife, we got this new thing where we like go on walks in the evening. And so she can't always sit in the experience because she's watching your bad kids in the back. And so, just kidding, your children are a gift that you keep on giving to us. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was telling her about the sermon. I'm like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this and, and that. And she was like, well, you better, don't you forget about so Shaquan. I was like, what about Shaquan? She was like, you talking about a testimony? I was like, you're right. Y'all know Shaquan? No, let me show her. Shaquan, come here real quick. She's so embarrassed. She didn't know I was gonna do this. I didn't do this at the 8.30. Hurry, 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 hurry. So Shaquan, come on. I'm, a, I'm, I'm here to help up, not hand out. And so, and so this is why I love Shaquan. Shaquan's married to the, the, the buff uh, keyboard player that we keep back there. And, um, and so Shaquan, we, she, she started coming to Legacy really early as well. And we got to go to dinner and hear her story. And, and she's a beautiful, strong, amazing woman. But honestly, if you were to have dinner with her and hear her story, I don't know of anyone who's had more of a traumatic upbringing and experienced more traumatic loss in life. I don't know. You might know. It might be you. I just hadn't met, and it broke my heart. But Shaquan is not a, a victim personality type of person. Matter of fact, Shaquan, at a few years ago, just randomly decided to enter a beauty pageant. Not only did she just enter a beauty pageant as a grown adult who had never done any beauty pageants in her life, she won. This is Miss Arizona. 
ladies and gentlemen. But it gets better. Not only did she enter and win a beauty pageant just to prove to herself that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I know that verse is taken out of context a lot, but hey, use it for the glory of God. This is what she also did. She would drive from Phoenix and she decided to revitalize something called Miss Juneteenth, which is a beauty pageant for colored girls in the city of Chandler. Hold on, I'm not done. Y'all cutting into my time with all this. Not only did she win Miss Arizona, she said, I want to instill the same confidence. I want to instill the same dignity to as many young girls as I can in the city of Chandler. She never lived in Chandler. She just went to church in Chandler. But she felt called to be in this city and have the responsibility to restore dignity to young girls. So now, how many years has it been doing uh, Miss Juneteenth? Four years of making sure that young girls can, regardless of their circumstance or upbringing, regardless of their parents' financial situation, be poured into, learn how to articulate with accuracy and with confidence their goals, learn how to take care of themselves, learn how to view themselves in the image of God, not what some ab abandoned deadbeat dad did or did not do, not based on what some crazy boyfriend did or did not do, but what does God say about my life? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm not done. I told you, shut, wait. She grew up in a poverty-stricken environment. Right after this, her and her husband are about to lead a financial peace university class because they are completely debt-free, meaning they don't owe nobody nothing. Not only that, she leads a step class. For, I'm, I'm just trying to let you know that there are people that have made a decision that if I can use my life for the glorification of God, even if it looks crazy, if it's for His glory, then it's worth it. What can He do in you? Thank you so much. Worship team, come on out here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If it looks like we're crazy, it's for the glory of God. If it looks like we're in our sound mind and we have it all together, it's for your benefit. But no matter what, we've made a decision that since Christ gave himself up for us, the least we can do is give our lives to back to him. Let me ask you this question, church. Can God trust you to pray, prophesy, serve, and show the will of God to your city, to your community, to your workplace, to your friend group, to your church? Can God entrust you with the secrets of heaven that they will not stop with you but they will be spoken out through you. That's a sobering thought to know that I'm not a captive, that I didn't come to Arizona just because it was cheaper. But I came to Arizona because God called me here. He had a purpose for me here. It's a sobering thought to think that God is depending on me. Matter of fact, put up 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 20. Quick, quick, quick. Matter of fact, trust technology no way. this is what it says so we are Christ's ambassadors everybody stand up stand up stand up we are Christ's ambassadors that means you have a job you have a purpose you have a responsibility God is making his appeal through us we speak for Christ when we plead come back to God we speak for Christ think about this I, I, I was I was with my, my 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 kids the other day, and my oldest she's 12, and my son he's three, and he was playing his little Nintendo Switch. That's kind of raising him right now in this season of life. I'm having to work on sermons for you, like help me, you know. So anyway, he's playing his game in the kitchen, and my daughter out of nowhere she just Justice, what do you want to be when you grow up? 
And I'm kid you not, he didn't even stutter or hesitate immediately. I didn't even know he was listening. She says, what do you want to be when you grow up? He says, Batman. <laughs> and that's what my daughter did. She said, okay, but what's your plan B? And right there, oh, I think it was Holy Spirit. I said, hey, ain't no plan B. He said he's going to be Batman. <laughs> Why? We have to understand that what God has called us to, there is no plan B. There is no other option. We are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. If you don't step up, your city loses. If you don't step up, your family loses. There is no plan B. There is no, well, somebody else at the church to do it. You are the church. There is no, well, I'm going to ask somebody to pray. You need to be the prayer warrior. There's no plan B. Tell the person next to you, say, you're Batman. And that's it. That's it. So when we say that our city is our responsibility, what we are saying is that we believe this word so much that if we are truly to pray for people who will not pray for themselves, if we are truly to prophesy a word of God over people that have believed the lies of the enemy for too long, if we are truly to serve people with the love of God in such a way that it restores their dignity, I told the team, hey, don't go cheap on homecoming. Homecoming is not the day we just do some ghetto cookout where we just give them whatever is the cheapest food option. We feed them good. We're not saving money, we're saving souls on homecoming Sunday. How? We don't got the resources or the manpower. We better do three experiences on homecoming. How? By the power of God. How? 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 By the power of God. How, how do you go from poverty and abuse to giving dignity and identity to numerous women across the valley? By the power of God. How do you go from being on church, de church, over church to leading in the church? By the power of God. How do you go from being someone who God did life happen to me to now God is using life to change lives through me? By the power of God. That's why when we sing songs, we're not playing karaoke. We're prophesying over our city. We're saying, come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. I know it looked dead, but come alive. Why? Because the Spirit of God is here. I showed up, so God showed up. I wish I had some worshipers that would start prophesying a better word. Come on, you better go. Hey, wherever you're watching this from, I want you to know something. God is with you. And if you're feeling something in your heart right now that is kind of convicting you or or awakening inside of you, I believe that's the Holy Spirit inviting you into a deep relationship with God. And so I want to lead you into a prayer. Uh, it's not magical. Uh, the Bible would describe it as a confession of faith. But what it does is it, it verbally articulates uh, what God is trying to do in your spirit and through your life. And it's simple. It's accepting the fact that you're a sinner, you're imperfect, you make mistakes. It's believing that Jesus loves you, that God sent him to die for you, to pay the penalty of your sins that you and I can pay for ourselves. But lastly, it's choosing him back, choosing to accept his love and choosing to love him back. So if you are with those three things, if you accept, if you believe, and if you wanna choose him back, then friend, you are now a follower of Jesus. And what that looks like is that you need to start walking out in the new life that God has for you. It's not easy, but it's worth it. So if you have, if you need help, if you need support, do me a favor, text SAVE to 84321. We would love to partner with you on your journey with Jesus. We love you. Congratulations and welcome to the family. If you enjoyed today's incredible message, please share with a friend. Don't keep this to yourself. Bless someone else. Here at Legacy, prayer is our priority. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Email our prayer team at prayer at legacyaz.church. And if you would like to financially partner with Legacy, you can text any dollar amount to 84321. You can also download the church app or visit our website, legacyaz.church, and click on Ways to Give. You'll see the links to support Legacy Church right there. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to comment and go out and love, live, and lead like Jesus.